Thumbs up? Yes? OK, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I haven't been, the last time I was um, here visiting for a colloquium was 2013. So that was quite a long time ago. And um, so it's really great to be back. And, uh, and I appreciate the nice weather that you dialed up. So thanks for that. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here today talking to you about CASTOR. Um, the, and that's a rather tortured acronym, which stands for Cosmological Advanced Survey Telescope for Optical and UV Research. Um, I have the pictures on this slide right now of Tyrone Woods and Viraj Akatu um, because I want to give them full credit for uh, they actually produced the bulk of these slides and have done a lot of the work here. And I just want to make sure and highlight them as leaders in early career researchers who've really contributed to this. So, um, so Castor, um, if you're, if you're not from Canada and you don't speak French, you may not realize castor um, it means beaver in French, which is also the national anim um, animal for Canada. So it's a very appropriate name. And, um, and you can see that we have a, a really snazzy logo up there. So what is castor? So I told you um, it means beaver in French, and, and it has this um, fancy name. Um, so it is a flagship Canadian-led space telescope, a plan for one, a proposal, an ambition, a vision for a large-scale Canadian-led space observatory. So if, you're, um, if you may not know, the Canadian um, astronomy community every decade gets together in a collaborative um, effort and decides what our research priorities are for the next decade. This is really important that we do this because we, um, in order to answer the science questions that we really care about, we need to invest large sums of money and also partner frequently with other communities, other international astronomy communities, so that we can build the facilities that allow us to answer the science questions that we care about. And so we have um, a collaborative effort where we get together every 10 years. Some of you undoubtedly participated in the last one, but I know there's a lot of students here, so you may not realize we do this. This is actually something that's unique to the astronomy community in Canada. The astronomy community and the high energy physics communities are the only two science communities in Canada that, that go through an effort like this. And it's been incredibly useful, powerful, and has allowed us to really um, come to consensus and solidify our ambitions and then to go and ask for the resources so that we can actually answer those exciting science questions we all care about. So CASTOR was identified as the highest recommendation for a large scale space astronomy mission um, to be, uh, that's our number one priority in space astronomy for a large scale mission. This was decided by consensus of the Canadian astronomy community. Um, it's an exciting mission. You can see the quote from the long range plan. Um, if you want a copy of it, they exist. It's available also online um, in French and English. Um, and so it, it comes together with the recommendations and the priorities for the community. And Castor was identified as the number one priority. So this is what it will do. It will provide a successor to the Hubble Space Telescope at ultraviolet and optical wavelengths. As, as you may know, Hubble is aging. And, uh, and the um, ex expected lifetime is, is not certainly expected to last beyond 2030. Um, and uh, the goal for Castor is to provide uh, the ultraviolet answer to current and future wide field imaging missions. So Euclid, which has already been launched by the European Space Agency, the Roman Telescope, which NASA will be launching shortly, um, and also on the ground, the, sorry, Rubin will not be launched. <laughs> that would be very expensive. Um, <laughs> Rubin is a ground-based telescope, so we're going to keep it on the ground. Um, but it's a wide field um, imaging observatory. And uh, Roman will be launched by NASA um, to, um, to also complement Castor um, and Euclid. So what are the specs? What, what is Castor able to do? Why is it so special? So first of all, it has a very wide field of view. So as you may know, the Hubble Space Telescope has quite a small field of view. Castor is much, much bigger, a quarter square degree. But the resolution is comparable to Hubble. And that's where, um, that's really the sweet spot where it brings science capability that we don't see with other, uh, with other proposed missions. Uh, the way the optical path is structured, you get simultaneous imaging in a UV band from 150 to 300 nanometers, um, a, uh, the U-band, which is 300 to 400 nanometers, 
and the G-band from 400 to 550 nanometers. And it is very sensitive, so it can go down to a magnitude of 27 um, in 600 seconds, which is very fast. Um, it will also have, so that's the primary main imaging instrument. It will also have a high precision photometer um, that is being um, designed for exoplanet science. Um, a grism, so that uh, takes the light, it's an optical element you put on the path to the imagers, it spreads the light out so you get a spectrum, uh, it's a slitless spectrum, so you get a spectrum every time you have an object in the image. And an ultraviolet multi-object spectrograph, which has a smaller field of view but provides higher resolution um, for multiple objects um, in a parallel field to the imaging field. The goal is to have at least a five-year mission. Um, the primary science <coughs> goals can be achieved in five years, but there are no consumables on board, and so it's the facility that could um, last for longer than that. And with the schedule that we have so far, um, launch is, uh, could happen in 2029. So just to show you that this is a real telescope, and um, here is some of the engineering models. I got these from Alan Scott from Honeywell Aerospace, who's one of the industrial partners. So this shows what Castor looks like from the outside. It's not a particularly large observatory, so the cost to, um, to build and operate it is much, much smaller than Hubble. Um, and you can see it's relatively compact, and it is being um, it's in intended for a sun-synchronous orbit. So as you may know, Hubble is in an equatorial orbit, which means it's in the sunlight and in the shadow and in the sunlight and in the shadow. Um, that is helpful if you're launching it from the space shuttle, but it's not very helpful if you want to control the thermal environment. So um, the orbit for Castor will be on the terminus between the day and the night sun, so you have a more constant um, thermal environment. Um, this is what it looks like, two, vi two views of it from the outside. And then this is the sort of exploded view um, of Castor where you can see where all of the different components fit together. I know from your point of view, it's probably quite challenging to read those labels um, or, to, or to see everything, but mostly I just want to demonstrate that this is, um, you know, we have engineering models of this. It's been under design um, for quite a while, for, um, for 12 years. And so this is something um, that has, uh, that is advanced in terms of the planning. So this is, the, um, this is what the spacecraft looks like. Um, and this is, uh, uh, demonstrates what the capability is. So on the left-hand side, you can see we have um, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. And you can see all those little red squares. Each one of those little red squares is the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope. And then on the right-hand side, you can see what happens when you have a quarter square degree. It does not take you nearly as long to map a nearby galaxy. Um, so the same resolution, the same spatial resolution, the sensitivity in the ultraviolet, but a much, much larger field of view. And so you're able to do mapping much, much more efficiently, about a factor of 100 faster as I think you can see quite clearly. Um, so this is, uh, so this is uh, clearly, a, a, I mean, you can, you can just look at this and see how much more science you can do when you can get so much higher mapping efficiency. Uh, the resolution is also going to be fantastic. So here, this just shows a comparison between Galax on the left. So that was the previous um, large field of view um, ultraviolet um, mapper, and on the right, that's a simulation for Castor, and you can see how much more you can do when you have much higher resolution. So Galax was the previous version. Um, recently, though, NASA has approved um, UVEX, which is the Ultraviolet Explorer. It was approved from the Mid Explorer program as the next um, as the next mission that's going to be supported by NASA, and this is an image of a globular cluster, and you can see on the left is a simulation of Castor, and on the right is a simulation from UVEX, and so UVEX has a very large field of view, um, but it has a much smaller, a, a much larger point spread function, so you can see that when you're looking at dense environments, um, like a, for example, a globular cluster, you lose a lot of information, and the other thing is you lose a lot of sensitivity because uh, you're taking your light for an object and you're spreading it out over a larger area, and so that reduces significantly the sensitivity you're able to achieve. So um, 
I want to compare Castor to some of the other large survey telescopes uh, Ed, that are going to be um, on the sky either now or in the near future. So this, um, this is kind of a standard way of representing survey sensitivity. Um, so on the left-hand side, that, that axis, the y-axis, shows you what the sensitivity is in magnitude. So bright is on the top and faint is on the bottom. And wavelength is the x-axis right there. So I've um, point used uh, Castor. You can see the Castor logo. Those red lines represent the Castor bands. And you can see that Castor is at shorter wavelengths than those missions I talked to you about, Euclid. Um, w first is the same thing as Roman. That was the older, uh, older name for it. So you can see that it focuses on the UV. So it's beautifully complementary to Roman and to Euclid. Um, it crucially has an overlap in the G-band, which Rubin also will observe from the ground. So being able to calibrate those two instruments independently is very important. And, uh, and then you can just see how sensitive it is. It's really, really sensitive. So in terms of discovery space, it really has a sweet spot that's both unique and very complementary to other facilities um, that are coming online. Here is some more details about the comparison between image quality and depth. And I just want to focus on these two panels. Star X was not chosen in the recent Mid Explorer down select. So, um, so that is not um, something that's going to happen in the near future. But UVEX and Castor really have different science goals in terms of the sensitivity um, and the image quality and also the band pass. So UVEX has a much larger field of view, 12 degrees squared as opposed to a quarter square degree, much larger field of view, uh, sorry, much, uh, much larger point spread function, full width half max of the, of the light of a point source. So that means it's not nearly as sensitive and you can't do the science that Castor will be able to do in terms of looking, for example, at shapes of galaxies, and looking at very faint things and also looking in very crowded environments. The band pass is also a little bit different. So um, UVEX has a far ultraviolet and a near ultra ultraviolet band, whereas Castor has ultraviolet, U-band, and G-band. Um, and also there are more instruments that are being planned for Castor. So there's the high precision photometer for exoplanet science, the multi-object medium resolution spectrograph, as well as the GRISM capability, um, which is, will cover the entire field of view. So they really have different science goals and different capabilities, um, but certainly having both of them on the sky at the same time would be fantastic. The Castor collaboration is large, pan-Canadian, and also international. So our industrial partners are Honeywell Aerospace. Honeywell Aerospace is responsible for the Canadian contribution to the James Webb Space Telescope. They were previously ComDev and now our Honeywell Aerospace. Um, ABB is also has a legacy of contributing to space astronomy and also ground-based astronomy missions. So they contributed to Herschel, um, also some of the ground-based instruments um, at the CFHT. And Magellan Aerospace is a aerospace company in Winnipeg, and they are building the bus. So that's the spacecraft, and they have a legacy of doing this um, uh, a historic legacy. So all of these companies have um, expertise and legacy in building spacecraft, space science uh, spacecraft, and they've been working with the university and CSA team for the past 12 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in terms of our partners in the government, so the National Research Council, as well as the Canadian Space Agency are both involved, and more than 20 universities um, have science team members who have contributed. Internationally, the Jet Propulsion Lab has been involved in terms of uh, specifically the coatings for the detectors. Uh, the UK Space Agency is very excited about this science and has committed millions of dollars in order to support um, uh, engineering development in the UK, and uh, also France, Spain, South Korea, and the Indian Space Research Organization have all been parts of earlier discussions, and there are science team members from each of those agencies. So this is really um, a pan-Canadian as well as international collaboration with a strong industrial legacy um, that will enable us to be successful. So the 
Science, of course, that's why we're doing this, because we have exciting science that we want to do. And um, this panel shows you what the eight different science team domains are. And you can see that it ranges from looking at small bodies in the outer solar system, extrasolar planets, stars, near field cosmology, so that's looking at nearby galaxies in the outer Milky Way, um, supermassive black holes, which is my, th my thing, um, as well as galaxies, uh, time domain activities and dark matter and dark energy. So it really covers the gamut, which you would want for a flagship mission, that it should cover, um, it should span the range of broad and exciting science cases. So to date, um, recently we have some, uh, we have a, there's a tool which is called Forecaster. Um, it's available for anybody to use. It's on the Canadian, um, uh, CANFAR, what does CANFAR stand for? The Facility for Astrophysics Research, so it's the computational resource that we all have access to as Canadian astronomers. Um, and so that is a tool that has been developed uh, a lot by actually interns and undergrads, which is really exciting, um, which allows you to do exposure time calculations and do simulations of Castor. And the paper which explains this was recently accepted, which is quite exciting. Um, and there's another one which has just been submitted. So this is work that is an outcome of, um, of the work that's been done so far to get things ready. So here are some specific science questions that we're focusing on for Castor. So the way the science case was developed is that there are legacy surveys that were proposed that would address the major science questions that were the, um, were the focus and the priority of each science working group. So. Um, this is a list of some of the legacy surveys. So there's a survey for astrophysics and cosmology, um, a TOO, so that's targets of opportunity, which is rapidly responding to the dynamic universe, um, a transit exoplanet survey, as well as a census, census of trans-Neptunians, so that's outer solar system objects, um, and many more. And I'm just gonna give you a few um, tidbits, a little, little delicious tastes of the exciting science questions that could be addressed by Castor, and then focus on the one that I'm involved in, which is related to measuring the masses of supermassive black holes. So here is an example of the kind of science that will be addressed. So um, in general, as part of the time domain um, survey, um, the question of where gold comes from, um, from massive explosions, can be addressed. The requirement is that there is a photometric survey with a daily cadence, so it returns to the same part of the sky every day. And it's important to have photometric and spectroscopic follow-up of triggers within two hours. So when we're developing the science case, we have the science team, which has the questions they want to answer, and that gives us the science requirements for the instruments and operations, which will allow us to answer these exciting questions. So the ultraviolet is really important for this particular science case, and this shows a simulation by the time domain team. So what this shows on the y-axis, you see flux, and on the x-axis, it shows rest wavelength, and you can see there's different curves right there. The Castor band pass is indicated by that yellow box, and you can see that if you're able to find these cosmic explosions at very early times, then what you can do is you can discriminate between different models. And so that's why, um, that's why the Kilanova people are very excited about Castor, because uh, that UV, um, accessing the UV in the early times for these explosions can discriminate between the different models. Um, so here is another example of, uh, this is just further um, examples that can be used. So this shows different models for when you have a kilonova, which is a giant explosion, and the, um, you can measure the mass of the ejecta in the blue, and so that y-axis shows you the mass of the blue ejecta. The x-axis shows how far away you can detect it, and depending on, um, on what the mass is, um, as well as you can observe them over, over time, see how things change, then that can discriminate between different models of, of what is actually um, the mass of the blue ejecta. 
So that's one of the science cases. Another science case um, is to um, look at the nearest thousand galaxies and take advantage of that very high spatial resolution in order to look at the, spec uh, the stellar populations. And with those resolved stellar populations, then that will tell you about the history of these galaxies. So ultraviolet light is very useful for looking at stars, both that are luminous and young, but also stars that are old and low metallicity. And the ultraviolet is really diagnostic for, for the nature of those different stellar populations. Looking at higher redshifts and large-scale galaxy surveys, this shows some simulations of what the fraction of, detect of detected galaxies are. So this is the mass power spectrum. So on the y-axis, that says how many, uh, what fraction of galaxies could be detected of a given brightness, um, which corresponds to mass in each of these redshift bins. And, um, and then there are three different surveys, a wide survey, which is more shallow, a deep survey, which is smaller area, but more sensitive, and then ultra deep, which is even smaller area, but much, much more sensitive. And so using the distribution of the brightnesses of all of these galaxies, that can tell you about the mass spectrum, and that um, can constrain um, cosmological parameters. So this is a work in progress, and this is really one of the key examples where having Castor and Euclid and Roman all up in the sky at the same time is so powerful because it allows you to observe galaxies with many, many, many colors, and so you can um, you can really nail down their redshifts and uh, and get all of the information at the same time. And so the UV is highly complementary for that. There's a lot of science cases that can be done only with Castor, and then additional science cases that get even better um, with Euclid and Roman as well. Um, in terms of looking at our Milky Way, so um, there are plans for um, a very large area survey, so over 4,000 pointings to map the halo of the Milky Way um, in the ultraviolet and find lots of halo stars um, with, with this light. Um, and the, not just halo stars, you can also look at more massive stars in the disk as well. Um, the other thing that you can do with the UV light that's really, that the exoplanet are, people are very excited about, so you've probably used to hearing about exoplanet work that happens in the near infrared. The ultraviolet is useful because it can be used to both look for o ozone in the atmospheres of um, exoplanets, plan planets that pass in front of their background stars. Um, looking through the, the light that passes through those atmospheres, there's some ozone bands, so that's one possibility. The other reason the ultraviolet is very important is that when you're looking at low mass stars, for example, M stars, uh, if they are active, that can impact the ability for a planet to be able to harbor life. And the activity of the star um, can be probed directly in the ultraviolet. So, that is, um, so that's why that is so useful for exoplanet studies. And the solar system community is also very excited to use Castor. So they are interested in looking again um, in the ultraviolet and with the U-band at trans-Neptunian objects. So those are small bodies in the solar system near the orbit of Neptune. And whether there are specific colors, so small objects, small bodies, primarily ref in the UV and, and U, they are reflecting sunlight but the relative colors in those two bands tell you something about the composition of the objects. So, um, so that's why the solar system people are very excited about it. And, um, and then this is more of the exoplanet um, science is, and this will take advantage of the ultra high precision photometry to look at the nearest Earth-like worlds and to uh, tell us more about what they're like. So, Though that is just to give you a little taste. I know this is very high level. Um, if you're really excited, there's many, many hundreds of pages of documentation that has been generated for Castor to give you more details on all of this. Um, but I'm gonna go into detail about um, the science case that I've been involved in, which is, um, is looking at the masses of supermassive black holes. So Castor um, will be able to weigh the masses 
of 1,000 supermassive black holes. Um, and in order to do this, we need to have high precision photometry, spectroscopy, and also repeated observations. So there's overlap with the science requirements for this science case as well as for the Kilanova case, um, that time domain uh, a repeated, repeatedly visiting a same part of the sky is really powerful for lots of different science cases. So I'm going to go into detail about this. And I want to give um, full credit to Virja Katu, who um, did her PhD at Western University with me. She's now a resident astronomer at CFHT. And so what I'm going to be showing you is primarily the work of her PhD thesis and her first postdoc. So, Castor is really ideal for doing a large scale echo mapping survey to measure AGN black hole masses. I'll explain to you how that works. But the reason the ultraviolet is so useful is that um, AGN, so active galactic nuclei in the centers of distant galaxies, their emission peaks in the ultraviolet. That's where the power peaks. So looking at where they are brightest, where, where they are most luminous is really helpful. Um, that's the peak of the accretion disk power. The other, um, the other thing is we're taking advantage of the time domain and variability in order to measure these black hole masses, and AGN vary more and on shorter time scales in the ultraviolet. So if we're focusing on that part of the spectrum, we can quite efficiently detect variability um, and with a shorter um, uh, in a shorter amount of time. So that's another reason that this is really good. Um, and the other thing is that we will be using both continuum emission as well as UV emission lines in order to probe, um, to measure these black hole masses. And the UV emission lines, the high ionization emission lines are coming from the inner, um, the inner regions. So again, that time delay Things that are closer vary more rapidly and on shorter time scales, and so, um, and so that's really useful. So if you're not used to looking at quasar spectra, um, I'm going to give you the opportunity right now. So, um, so this is a quasar spectrum. So if you've looked at other kinds of spectra, what you might notice about a quasar spectrum that's different, so on the y-axis we have flux, on the x-axis is wavelength. Um, and so what you can see is that quasar spectra are blue. So that means there's more power at shorter wavelengths. Um, what you'll see is that dashed line represents the continuum emission. The continuum emission comes from the accretion disk. So that's the disk of gas swirling around the supermassive black hole. That's the source of the AGN's power. And then what you can see is very broad emission lines. The broad emission lines have widths of thousands of kilometers per second, and that's from the gas that's moving very rapidly around the central supermassive black hole. So the emission lines are very strong, and they're very broad. And what, we can ex what is accessible to Castor is those high ionization lines, so carbon-4, um, which is carbon that's missing three electrons. Um, lime and alpha, so that's a hydrogen line, um, as well as carbon-3 and magnesium-2. So those, those lines are accessible to Castor. From the ground, for, those, for the same objects, you are looking at different emission lines, which are lower ionization. They're coming from further out in the black hole system. And so, um, and so they're just they're probing a different region. So here's an artist picture to give you a better idea of what it looks like. And so you have the black hole in the center. You can't see the black hole, of course. It's black. Um, and no light can escape the black hole. What we see is the light from the accretion disk, which is um, outside of the event horizon. And the accretion disk has a gradient of temperature, so it's hottest in the center. It gets cooler as it moves out. So that means the light that comes from the center is shortest wavelength, highest energy. As you move out, you're looking at lower energy light. And so we're focusing on the ultraviolet. That's the part where the accretion disk power peaks. And it's also closer to the black hole than, um, than the opt optical and the ultraviolet. Um, and so if we, have a, um, if we have a flash, you can imagine you have a supermassive black hole. It's a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. You have gas swirling around it at thousands of kilometers per second. This is a dynamic system. It is not constant. It varies. And so if you have a little uh, brightness, a continuum flare in the center, it moves out. Um, and then further out, the gas that creates the emission lines is further out. It gets illuminated by that continuum, and it responds. So if your continuum gets a little brighter, your emission lines are going to get a little brighter, but with some time delay, because that light has to travel out to the broadline region where that emission line gas is coming from. 
And so here again, there's that continuum flare. The broadline region along the line of sight is going to respond more quickly because it has a shorter path length. And the broadline region that is in, in, other, um, in the plane of the sky, there's going to be a little bit longer of a time delay uh, just because of the, of the finite travel time of light. So here's a diagram that just illustrates this point. And I'm explaining to you the methodology for how we can weigh supermassive black holes by looking at how their light changes over time. So in the lower left corner there, that's a little diagram. So the black hole's in the center. We're looking at the accretion disk system edge on. So we have the black hole. There's the x-ray emission. That's what we have in the center. The accretion disk, the UV emission's coming from the center. Um, and then what happens is the observer, that's us with our telescope, and then you have the light, the continuum um, gets a little brighter, it sends the light out. Um, further out, we have the broadline region, the broadline region responds, so it would get a little brighter as well, but depending on which part of the accretion disk you're looking at, the continuum will reach the observer first because it's traveling straight to us, and then the light that goes out to the broadline region and then goes to the observer, there's going to be a bit of a time delay. And so this allows us to actually measure the radius of the broadline region. So that's what that little diagram does right there. We know what the speed of light is. If we can measure the time delay, then that allows us to figure out what the radius is. So AGN systems are tiny on the sky. They're micro arc seconds. We can't take images of them, but we can use the time domain to figure out how they're structured. And so this just shows what actual data looks like. So on the top, these are two light curves. The top light curve is the continuum emission. So we have flux on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And you can see it's bouncing around. And then there's a bit of a flare. And then the bottom represents the light from the emission line. You can see that the error bars in the emission lines are typically larger, so you can't measure them as um, precisely as you can the continuum emission. But there's a bit of a, a lag. And in this particular case, the lag is 15 days. So that gives you a sense of um, what kinds of delays we're looking at. And then um, in practice, what you do is you take each light curve and you slide them back and forth until um, till the, the bumps, the ups and downs match. And so this just shows a little um, animation of that. So you can see that you just shift the two light curves until the, um, the peaks match. Um, you're using all of the data, but this, is, this is just indicates um, visually what you're seeing. And that when you have that time lag, that you can use that information then to, um, uh, this is called a cross-correlation, but you can use that information then to determine the radius. And in general, this technique is called reverberation mapping. So you have a variability in the continuum, the light goes out, you have a response in the broadline region, you measure the time lag there that allows you to figure out what the radius is. And then because we these systems, the mass is centrally concentrated, the black hole is much more massive than the whole rest of the system, it's dominating the dynamics, then um, we the gas is expected to be in Keplerian motion. And so we have a radius from the time lag, um, g, we're all over g. We know what the gravitational constant is. And, um, and then the velocity, we can measure that from the width of the emission lines. That gives us the velocity. And so that allows us to determine the black hole mass. So this is what is considered the gold standard of measuring masses for um, active galaxies, is to use this technique. So if you think about what is required um, in order to design a survey. So our goal, remember, we want to measure the masses of 1,000 supermassive black holes. And just to give you some context, to date, there have been measured about 160 um, supermassive black holes. And almost all of them are very nearby. They have been measured with this specific technique. So uh, we want to measure 1,000 black hole masses and also to look further out in the universe so we can see how the uh, black hole mass accumulates over cosmic time. So what uh, Virja did for her thesis is she put together an AGN survey simulation. So because we want to know how much area do we need to cover, how often do we need to look at different parts of the sky, 
um, what kind of signal to noise do we need, what spectral resolution, how often are we going to return to the same part of the sky, and then how many AGN do we need to observe in order to actually measure the black hole masses of a thousand of them. So um, this is a very, um, very simple looking diagram. It's not a very simple looking process to actually put all this information together. And so um, that is, but this is what went into the simulation in order to design the legacy survey so we could achieve our science goal. This shows one of the simulations that was done. So here, <coughs> excuse me, on the left hand side we have a simulated castor image and on the right hand side that's a simulated grism image. So as I mentioned before, a grism is an optical element. So the light comes in, it hits the grism, the grism spreads out the light onto your um, imaging detector, and so that's why you have stripes for all of the different objects. And so what we need to do is we need to measure the light from the continuum as well as the light from the emission lines. And so the legacy survey has a combination of these two things, taking just images as well as these grism images in order to measure the light from the emission lines. Now, one of the challenges with designing a survey like this is, of course, we're just looking out at the sky, and we see everything that's in a cone, and so some stuff is close to us and some stuff is far away from us. The other thing is that AGN vary depending on how luminous they are, and the luminosity depends on how far away something is. So if we're looking, if, we're, if we want to look at luminous things, they're rare. We need to look at larger volumes of the sky, but they also vary on, lo on longer time scales. And if we want to look at less luminous things, they're fainter. Um, they vary on shorter time scales, which is good, but we may not be able to detect as many of them because they're fainter. So these are the sorts of things that need to be taken into account and why you need to actually spend you know, a good chunk of your PhD doing a simulation to figure out how to do this properly. Um, so this is an example of, some of, the, of one of the figures that Verge um, did. So, and what this just shows you is, so on the y-axis, that shows you a campaign length in months. On the top panel, that is for carbon-4. The bottom panel is for magnesium-2. And the reason those are separated is carbon-4 is a high ionization line. It's on the inner part of the broadline region. And so it's going to vary on shorter time scales than magnesium-2, which is farther away, so it'll vary on longer time scales. So, and what this basically shows is here's a bunch of different curves for objects of different luminosity, if you want to measure a time lag for a more luminous object, chances are it's going to be farther away, and we have to worry about redshift uh, time dilation. And also, it's going to vary on longer time scales. So in order to look at those very luminous objects, we're going to have to have a much longer campaign. Whereas if we want to look at less luminous objects, we don't have to have such a long campaign, but they're fainter, and so we, uh, we won't be able to detect as many of them. So this, uh, the details of this figure don't matter so much. I just want to sort of share some of the complexity of actually designing this. And what um, one of the uh, outcomes of Verge's thesis was to really figure out where, what is a sweet spot for Castor. So on the, on the y-axis here, we have luminosity of AGN. Um, and on the x-axis is redshift. And so what this shows is this is all of those different colors. You can see red and green um, and light blue and dark blue. That shows um, the different objects that have, been, um, that have been observed for reverberation mapping campaigns. And what you can see is there's a lot at relatively low redshift that are relatively faint. Those are a lot easier to do. As you go to higher redshift, you need longer campaigns. Um, and you can only really detect the most luminous objects. But they take a really long time to vary. And then what is exciting about Castor is that you can see all those black and gray circles. That is the discovery space for Castor. So not only can we go to quite high redshifts, but also we can go quite a bit fainter. And that's, what, that's the benefit of, using, of going in the ultraviolet, because these objects are um, because the power of AGN peaks in the ultraviolet um, and being in space and having that really um, small point spread function that allows us to measure the black hole masses of, um, of many objects that are relatively fainter than the other surveys which are planned for the future. So, um, so this is I mean, this is why I've been spending my time on Castor, because I'm super excited about the science and the possibility of this. And Castor is really a, um, um, 
It's almost like someone designed it for this kind of, uh, this kind of science. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the timelines for um, Castor. So now um, we are in 2024. So that's the early part. Uh, that's sort of the middle of this timeline. And basically, all of those other labels up before just shows the work that we've done so far. So we had um, a science maturation study. We have had a phase zero study. That's the phase, uh, that's the kind of science development and engineering development you do before you have an official mission. And so we're at a point right now where we are waiting for funding approval. Um, the cost of Castor, the, um, the Canadian contribution would be approximately $300 million over a decade. And that kind of money is not the sort of money that the Canadian uh, <coughs> Space Agency um, has access to. And so in order to get this funded, we need to go and ask the federal government to support this mission. Um, the astronomy community has been successful doing this before, um, and Christine Speckens can talk about that. So recently, the Square Kilometer Array was approved. It has the same sort of um, budget, um, same order of magnitude for this kind of budget, but it has to be that the federal government makes a choice that this is a priority and puts it as a line item in the budget. So, um, so this process is a little different than maybe other things you're used to. Um, and then the, the bottom orange band just shows what would happen next. So if we get awesome news next month that Castor has been funded, then we can get going with the phase A study, um, and that would allow us to keep to schedule and have a launch in 2029. Um, and then, of course, any delay in that would have a corresponding delay in, um, in the launch timeline. So I just want to put this um, uh, last... Um, last sort of point up on the board. So, um, so we're excited about Castor. There are 100 astronomers who invested a lot of time into developing the science case, as well as, um, as, well as our partners who have been developing the engineering design. Um, and because of that, there are a lot of things that are being discovered and technologies that are being advanced that have much broader applications than just what, what we as astronomers can do um, for our science. So um, this just gives an example. So for example, broadband coatings, that will allow us to get the sensitivity we're looking for in the ultraviolet. That's a technology that's being advanced through the process of this. Um, that can have a, a lots of applications, uh, large format detectors, the electronics, um, and one of the things that is a strategic priority also in the, in the space sector is having optical ground links. So typically we get data from space, um, is sent down over radio frequencies, but Castor is going to have a lot of data and we need to be able to access it rapidly in order to do our time domain science. And so optical downlinks can, travel, can transfer a lot more information. And so that's a, um, that's a technology that is key for lots of sectors, but Castor would certainly be able to help advance that. Um, so I'll just uh, leave this up as my summary slide. And thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.